Hi, uh, my name is Dutch Reuter. I work at the Charleston Library Society. Um, we are super excited for this event today um, and this partnership with the uh, Charleston County Public Library and Eden Royce, our Charlestonian abroad. Um, we, I, I can't get the smile off my masked face right now, um, but we just are over the moon that we're able to celebrate um, a wonderful author um, and a wonderful talent especially this month, uh, International Women's History Month. So congratulations on your first uh, YA publication. Uh, this is, it's gotten great reviews. It's gotten great response. Um, and we feel honored that we get to be the institution in your hometown that gets to help promote it and celebrate it. Um, for those of you in the audience that don't know the Charleston Library, we are the second oldest continually circulating library in the US. We're the oldest cultural institution in the South. Um, and we're just a lot of fun here. <laughs> and we, we like to keep things different, exciting and dynamic, especially with this past year. Um, so this event today is gonna be one of those special events. So thank you for joining us. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to Devin, um, our partner at the Public Library. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Devin Andrews. I'm an associate director here at Charleston County Public Library. And that said it wonderfully, we are thrilled to have partnered with the Charleston Library Society to bring Eden Royce to you guys today. Um, here to talk with Ms. Royce is our very own Darcy Coover, who is the team system coordinator here at Charleston County Public Library. I'll give a little intro to Darcy and then hand it off to her. <laughs> Darcy came from a background in education and student services before earning her MLIS in 2011 and coming to work for Charleston County Public Library. She served as the Assistant Manager of Young Adult Services until joining CCPL's Department of Community Engagement in 2019 as the Team System Coordinator. She's a senior apprentice with Tycho Charleston, runs agility with her dog Kira, and collects cool looking rocks. Darcy? <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Devin. Uh, I forgot to tell you, you did not have to include the part about the cool rocks if it was a little too silly for today. Um, I am super excited to be here with Eden. Um, of course, Eden Royce is a native of the Charleston area. She's also a member of the Gullah Geechee Nation, um, and she's now living abroad in England with her husband. Uh, her short fiction can be found online and in her two print collections of Southern Gothic horror, and that is Spook Lights and Spook Lights 2. So if you like the Gothic horror, that's where to go. Um, Eden is a recipient of the Speculative Literature Foundation's Diverse Worlds grant, and Root Magic is her debut novel, and I believe also your first time writing for a middle grade audience. Is that right? That is correct, yes. What an exciting transition. Well, hello, Eden. Hello, thank you for inviting me. It's exciting to be nice here. Nice to see you again. Um, so folks, we're going to kind of jump right in with some discussion with Eden, but we will leave time at the end if you guys have questions. Um, I believe that Dutch and Laura from the Library Society are going to keep an eye on that. So um, if you do have questions, hang on to them and we'll make sure to get to them at the end. Uh, so Eden, I guess we'll jump right in. Did you always know that you wanted to be a writer? I didn't. I always loved reading and immersing myself in those worlds, having that escape, and years after reading something, still remembering it and still having it, having it make an effect on my life. And eventually, I think it was a natural progression that I wanted to write and create my own worlds, and hopefully one day create something that will resonate with someone else for years to come. Awesome. Um... Now, did you, when you did start writing, did you know that you wanted to write about Gullah Geechee culture? Was it that you got into speculative fiction and horror and thought, oh, some of this stuff can work right in? Or, or did you always know that it was important to you to bring your culture to your writing? I think it's natural to bring culture to writing, whether you recognize it or not. Sometimes in looking back on the things that you've written, you realize that you've incorporated something that is a part of your culture, but it's so innate to you that it just makes it in the work without you really realizing it. Mm. But as far as speculative fiction and dark fiction, I've always loved that. I always loved reading um, Mary Shelley, reading Poe. On, on Sunday afternoons, I would watch um, these black and white movies, like these hammer horror movies, with my mother and my grandmother. And so it's a, it was a family a family affair actually watching Christopher Lee, you know, grabbing up, you know, people on the moors and taking them back to his castle. 
So I've always enjoyed dark fiction. And I remember asking my grandmother once, I said, aren't you, aren't you scared by these movies? Does, doesn't this make you nervous? And she said, oh no, monsters don't scare me, people do. And that's always stayed with me. So a lot of times in my work, you know, it isn't always the monsters you have to be afraid of. Sometimes it's the people as well. Or sometimes the people are the monsters. Absolutely. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, and if, if for those of you who haven't had a chance to read Root Magic yet, um, it is for a middle grade audience, but there are definitely some really creepy moments in there. I don't want to, um, I don't want to spoil anything, but I don't want to spoil anything. There was a moment <laughs> in, in the in the book where I went oh, and I was reading here at work at my desk, like under the fluorescent cheerful lighting. It's sunny outside and I was reading and there was a part that just made me like pee my pants. So uh, well done. It's not too scary for middle grade, <laughs> but you got, you got me for sure. Um, so going going back to the the root work tradition that is such a huge part of root magic is is that a tradition that is in danger of being left behind in the community here or is it still really held on to? Can you talk, just talk some more about, this is an aspect of culture that I think even those of us from Charleston really don't know very much about, a lot of us. I would say that maybe 10, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. there were fewer people being upfront about the fact that they practice root work but very recently there's been a resurgence of interest in mm -hmm. African traditional religions and practices and um, spiritual ritual that people have gone back to not only research, but sort of embrace and add their own twist to what is a very um, ancestral magic for Gullah Geechee people, um, tracing its roots back to Western and Western Central Africa and holding on to those ancestral ties and doing those practices is something that I see a lot of new people coming to voodoo tradition, coming to root work and embracing it. I think that maybe as recently as five years ago, there were probably people that weren't as upfront about the fact that they practice or had a practice or took bits and pieces and incorporated it into their lives. But I think now people are making sure that this is something that is seen as um, as valid and as a vibrant, growing, changing practice. And there's a lot of that conflict in in the book between these traditional practices and trying to make it in a mainstream world. And so that that push and pull in, in the narrative is is really compelling. I thought. Um, oh, thank you. I think <laughs> it's something that a lot of people um, deal with, and I think that they believe you have to take one path or the other. Sure. And in my author's note for Root Magic, I mentioned that there were two Helens in my life. One was my grandmother, and she was very interested and very straightforward, let's say, <laughs> in making sure that I had a good school education. And therefore that would set me up to have a good job so that I would be able to take care of myself and have a good life. But I also had my great aunt, who was from the Sea Islands, who practiced root work and said, absolutely, you should do that. But you should also know about these things as well and know about these practices as well. They can be side by side. And that's what I wanted to bring to root magic. And that's what, what Jez and Jay face, trying to find a balance in their own lives between school, on the path to success traditionally, but also holding on to their heritage. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we can do both of those things successfully. I think so too. And I, I think it's, um, it's really interesting. That I'm looking down at the book every time I look down, by the way. Um, I think it's really interesting that you made them twins as well, because it's, you know, we, I guess, have this expectation of twins being really similar, but you see Jay a little less, maybe intuitively uh, into the root magic. And Jez, Jez seems to take to it really, really closely. And he's still kind of worried about you know, the guys at school and um, it, it was just a, a really, I thought, really realistic look at, at what it is probably like and, and people who have other, other traditional beliefs that they're trying to keep, keep rooted in the family without. Absolutely. And, 
and also to touch on how these magics and how these practices are different for boys versus girls mm. and how it's seen for girls to do things versus for boys to do things. And I wanted to bring that out as well, because there is that divide also of what's okay for boys to do isn't always seen as okay for girls to do. And to have that push and pull between the twins so that just naturally societally, they are split, whether they want to be or not sometimes. Sure. So in, in the book, you know, Jez gets called a witch by the kids at school, and that doesn't seem to happen with Jay. And I think you see that with a lot of um, traditional magic um, based faiths, not just root work, not just in, in the Gullah community, but uh, even in Western European beliefs, you see that where, where women are witches and men are practitioners, sort of. Mm. Um, I thought that was, um, I, I just found it really compelling. If you haven't read Root Magic, please, please pick up a copy. Um, and the, the setting is so evocative for those of you, I'm sure most of you are probably tuning in from Charleston or from the Low Country. Um, it's so evocative of the Low Country and the Sea Islands. Um, and I know Eden that the, the idea of Southernness in fiction is really important to you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about Aside from the setting, what does that mean to you, Southernness, when you write about it and you talk about it? Well, Southernness in fiction, I think, extends to how Southerners react to the world around them, hmm. how they think, how they see things, which is sometimes very different from people who are not from the South. I've seen a lot of movies or read books where there's someone from elsewhere coming to the South, and a lot of their reaction is, oh, well, that's strange. Well, that's weird. You know, and, and seeing us and portraying us sometimes in media as very odd and very other because of our beliefs. And part of that Southerness is what I wanted to bring to the book because a lot of times we do see things in a way that others don't. A lot of times our conversations are very sort of uh, incorporating talk about magic or ghosts or you know, people coming back or unusual rituals to others. And I wanted to make sure that this was a very Southern book mm -hmm. um, from a language point of view, from a word choice point of view, um, even from a, a sentence structure and how we speak about things. I wanted that to really be apparent. And a lot of those um, tidbits that I put into the book, when I went through copy edits, there were a lot of, uh, those little speech bubbles on the side of the <laughs> manuscript that said, is this the word you want to use? Are you sure about this? <laughs> um, so I had to go through a lot of that and say, this is exactly the, the phrase that I want her to say. This is how Southerners react to this. Um, she wouldn't be surprised because her family talks about ghosts and things like that all the time. So this isn't going to be a shock to her. So a lot of those things I wanted to be innate to the southernness and not have a reaction of oh my gosh somebody mentioned that you know they were speaking to someone who had passed away a year ago or that something told them that they should call someone hmm. and those are things that are woven into the southern culture very deeply and it isn't something that we necessarily question we get those feelings or we feel like someone sort of leading us or guiding us to make a decision and we act on it. And that is part of that connection that we have to ancestry, even more especially in the Gullah Geechee community. Sure. Yeah, and I think um, uh, speaking as someone who, I have lived here in Charleston for a little over 20 years, but I'm not really a native southerner. So um, it, it is, it can be different. And I think there's a lot of, um, obviously a lot of stereotypes about southerners from, uh, fiction that is created from people who are outside looking in. So um, I think that's a really interesting take. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention yeah. is I think that a lot of times with media, especially probably more so in film, um, Southerness is almost seen as shorthand for someone who isn't as well educated sure. or who Absolutely. isn't as progressive or you know, you don't even have to sort of do any character building. You give that character a very rural Southern accent. And we as a viewer are supposed to immediately know, mm -hmm. well, this person is, is a bit backwards. 
And I definitely wanted to write something that refuted that because it is such a prevalent um, trope to use. Yeah, I think you, you definitely succeeded there. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit too about um, when we study Southern fiction in mainstream schooling and public school, a lot of that fiction comes out of the Southern Gothic tradition. So it's Flannery O'Connor, Tennessee Williams, Eudora Welty, you know, they're wonderful authors, but they're coming from a very specific um, experience of being white people in the South. And I was wondering if you might talk a little about the intersection of, of Southerness and Blackness and, and the way that that guided your fiction sort of. Well, I think it, is inherent sort of in my fiction. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I will say is about three years ago, maybe two years ago, um, I did a mentorship and the young writer that I was speaking with uh, really wanted to be able to write Southern Gothic fiction. And she was a young black woman. And she said that her professor in her MFA course asked her why she would want to write in the Southern Gothic uh, genre when it was already a dead genre. Hmm. And I was really surprised by the fact that um, she would get that sort of feedback when in reality a lot of the Southern Gothic tradition hasn't incorporated Black writers. And saying that a genre is dead and, and isn't useful um, for even pursuit for education and learning about it um, is concerning. And I fully embrace the genre of Southern Gothic in my fiction, because when I look at the tenets of the genre with the macabre and the grotesque and talking naturally about ghosts and the beyond and familial strife, all of that, the, the decay and the deterioration of locales, all of that makes, a, makes an appearance in my fiction. And I wanted to embrace the Southern Gothic tradition because there aren't a lot of Black writers that are mentioned. If you go and Google Southern Gothic writers, you really aren't going to see Black writers represented there. Mm -hmm. And I wanted us as Black people to be a part of the story where we aren't secondary or tertiary characters. They're used for background when in a lot of these books, if we are mentioned at all, we're put in a set dressing and not much is said about our lives in relation to how we truly live and being able to put a representation of how we truly are and how we truly live is part of the importance of that intersection of showing Southerness and showing Blackness because on top of Southerness being seen as something that's shorthanded for people who are a bit backwards a lot of times that's how Black people are portrayed in certain <clears throat> media as well. So being able to show that Black people, Southern Black people and Southerners are indeed different from the years and years of portrayals that we have on the screen, starting to refute that is part of the reason why I write the things that I write. Um, I guess you might say Southern Gothic is a genre that is just not, it's not finished yet. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I really see stuff like Root Magic and, and your work as kind of challenging the accepted canon, I guess. And that's common, I guess, across all, all genres of literature. But And looking at a lot of the books that are coming out where people are putting whatever their personal identity or background is and mixing that with Gothic shows that those traditions aren't truly gone aren't truly dead and aren't truly finished. So there are people that are embracing the Gothic as a tradition because it is really a part of marginalized people's experience, mm -hmm. just naturally. Um, I read a review of Root Magic by Brent Lambert um, and he, he said, you know, this is not a book of pain um, but you do include a lot of depictions about how painful it can be to be Black in America, especially the book is set in the 60s. Um, was it hard for you as you were writing to kind of, did you have to try and strike a balance between being true to that pain and showing it, but also showing Black joy? And um, was that difficult for you because you're writing for a younger audience or is it something that 
I don't, maybe it's not difficult, but <laughs> actually, actually, it wasn't difficult for me mm -hmm. because I think that portraying black people and black Southerners as we really are, we have experiences with pain, but a lot of our lives revolve around joy as well. Yeah. Um, but historically, a lot of the books that are published about us and about the black experience tend to focus on pain. Mm -hmm. So when we're really portraying what our lives are like, there is a lot of joy. So it wasn't difficult to include that and incorporate that, but I wanted to make sure that what I put on the page and what I show, especially for kids, because a lot of times it's not that kids don't understand pain and they don't understand difficult things, but typically kids have almost um, an innate joy hmm. or they're almost innately able to find joy or find sides of things. And putting that together in a book for kids, I wanted them to have something that they recognized as well and then put it with some of the historical events that are that are accurate for the time period so that they can see and understand that these things happened and these things happened to people at this time, but they were able to find joy in sort of certain parts of their lives as well. Do you, um, do you feel like you have like a burden of representation when you're writing? Or I, I, hear, I read a lot of black authors who talk about trying to strike a balance between being sort of tokenized into like, here's a black writer and they're going to write about the black capital B experience, capital E in America. Or um, did you find that it came easily to you to just be a, an authentic voice and, and kind of create this own voice as narrative that was just realistic rather than to be put on a pedestal? I think I'm very lucky in that right now there is a movement where people are making sure that readers, viewers, whatever the, the medium happens to be that's creative, people understand as consumers of this media that Black people aren't a monolith mm -hmm. and you can expand that to whatever type of people you'd like, but making sure that people understand that we are incredibly different regarding regardless of whether that difference is regionally, socioeconomically, um, there's a variety of reasons why we could be incredibly different as people. And the quote, black experience isn't one thing. Um, I was on a podcast probably three or four years ago now with some other Southern writers. And one of the things we talked about was being Southern even isn't a monolith. And people looking from the outside in, they just go southernness or southerners. But Charleston is not Memphis, you know, mm -hmm. is not Jacksonville, is not Wilmington. So the South is a very different place depending on where you are. And individuals are very different. So I didn't feel a, a burden to be sort of a voice for mm -hmm. one portion of people. But I did want to be true to the story that I heard sort of in my head that was part of the Gullah Geechee experience and part of my family's experience. And a lot of those conversations I had with family members, that's the thing that I really wanted to be true to. Um, I didn't really ask you this before, but wh where did the story come from? Did it? Did it just occur to you whole cloth or did you, you know, some people think of um, their characters first and then the plot or vice versa, or um, how, how did that work out for you for Root Magic? It definitely came in bits and pieces. Uh, it started life as a short story. Hmm. And then I did NaNoWriMo, which is National Novel Writing Month. And I made some notes and in that 30 days, it became a collection of short stories. And at that time, publishers weren't really looking to publish single author collections very much. So I went back and wrote to connect those stories. So it would be more of a character arc instead of the rise and fall of individual plot lines, but with the same characters. So it was more of a, I had the idea for a short story. I wanted these 
Gullah Geechee kids to be experiencing magic for the first time and having some wonder and having some uh, whimsy in their life in addition to the spooky creepiness of it. <laughs> so after several iteration, iterations and rewrites and bits and tweaking, it became root magic. That's interesting. I um, It kind of ties in a little bit to my next question was how, how do you go from writing short fiction to writing a novel? Um, and you've kind of answered that a little bit, but what else changed for you in terms of your writing process? And then the actual publishing process must be very different too. It is very different. <laughs> um, as far as the writing process, moving to over 50,000 words for a work from probably only writing 5,000 words before that per project, it seemed incredibly daunting to move from short fiction to a novel. But again, it's that natural progression that I wanted to do. I wanted to try doing a novel. And that was where NaNoWriMo came in again. I thought I can not be alone in this process of someone trying to bring a novel to fruition in a very abbreviated period of time and trying to get away from any perfectionist complex that you may have, any sort of self-edit feature that you may have of wanting to write a line and thinking that it isn't perfect and going back. And that forces you to move forward with just writing the words and worrying about making changes, making edits, making it so-called perfect later. Um, do you, are you gonna write more novels? <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually have, I have written a second novel. Um, I will tell you about that after I tell you a little bit about how the yeah. publishing process was different. I forgot yeah. about that part. The publishing process for short fiction was finding oh. online magazines or anthologies that would have an open call for submission with a deadline and usually a theme and a list of things that they either wanted to see or didn't want to see. And it was a way of forcing myself to make a deadline so that I could have that story ready and emailed off to them or submitted through their submission form. And with the novel, I actually had a longer process because I had to not only finish the novel and get edits done, I had to look for an agent, which was a lot of research to find someone that represented what I wrote. Um, and not a lot of people at that time had Southern Gothic fiction necessarily as what they wanted to publish. And then I finally did find an agent who wanted some more edits. And after that, it was having the agent go and look for a publisher. So it was a longer process and a much more hands-off process but it was a lot of research on the front end. And then, as I mentioned earlier, lots of edits, lots of changes, uh, rereads and rewrites and all of that good stuff. And a lot of people involved to help make the book a real tangible thing that I can hold in my hands. Um, so what about your, your second novel? My second novel is <laughs> my second novel is another it's another middle grade. Um, this time it is a contemporary. It isn't um, a historical, but it is uh, incorporating lots of magic and magic systems. And I've also started a third. I haven't finished that one, but I have started a third. So I was up this morning um, on my Zoom call with my writer friends uh putting in my hours first thing this morning it's exciting i'm excited for more magic more magic and more <laughs> southernness so it's, it's oh, great a southern uh story as well i that's, can say that at this point it's really exciting <laughs> um will you i guess you've kind of talked about this a little bit will you do you have advice for aspiring writers um maybe you can talk a little bit about if your advice is different for short fiction versus people who want to publish a novel, um, what you got? <laughs> um, as far as general advice is, is just keep going. There's a lot of things that uh, 
the road to publishing can throw up in front of you. Um, it can be rejections. It can be not feeling that your work is at a point where you're even ready to show it to someone. And there's that natural self-doubt that a lot of writers get. Um, and pushing past that is something that doesn't always come easily. Sometimes it is a learned behavior and learning how to deal with rejection because getting that very first rejection for your work is tough because you've written something that is a part of you and you've shared it with someone and no matter how beautifully worded that rejection letter is, it's still a rejection letter and it feels like, okay, I'm going to close my computer for the rest of the day and do something else, but just keep going, keep focusing, keep improving and keep writing. Um, when it comes to short fiction, um, research the magazine or research the publisher, see what other things they've published, you know, do your due diligence to sort of give your yourself a chance to say, is this someone that would publish my work? Do they publish similar things? So don't set yourself up for something that may be a less natural fit for your work. Uh, I would also say, no matter whether you're self-publishing or going big five or going for a smaller publisher, um, be as professional as you can. As small as publishing is, um, lots of people know each other. Um, people have long memories. So just be as professional and kind as you can or polite as you can. Um, I think if you're looking for a larger publisher for your work, patience is key. The wheels sometimes turn really, really slowly and try and find another project to work on while you're waiting for that response because um, that's so much better than just hitting refresh on your email all day. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the way that you use NaNoWriMo. Uh, I, I've heard of other authors who do that. Um, do you think it kind of creates sort of a safety net for you where you're like, I'm, I'm just gonna write the most that I can in this month. And then at the end, I'll see what I've got. Is that kind of, did it kind of take the pressure off of like, I have to get my novel published? Um, do you think it's a good entry point for people who are maybe intimidated to get started, but they know they do wanna write? I think it's a good entry point for a lot of reasons. I think writing is a very solo act in and of itself. And having community is huge. Having that sort of creative spirit sort of around you, some place to check in, someone to be accountable to, even if it is a spreadsheet where you enter, this is how many words you wrote today. Um, a lot of times people do NaNoWriMo, they may or may not finish their first or second times. But it is a place where you can come and feel accepted regardless of whether you've prepped for it, whether you finish. A lot of people go in not having prepped. Some people go in with notes. A lot of times it's a come as you are. You're completely welcome to try okay. this out. And it is a place where you feel less, less awkward. So I think it can be a great entry point into it. And a lot of times there are forums where people are willing to share their experiences. They're willing to talk about um, publishers or agents or things that worked for them. And you can find some community and people that you may actually be able to interact with outside of NaNo, that mm -hmm. you can set something up separately to have a chat or have a writing sprint where it can have, it can give you some outside motivation instead of always being self-motivated. Sure. And I probably dating myself here, but I was on Live Journal in the early 2000s when, when NaNoWriMo sort of became a thing. And so it, I'm not a writer myself, but to see that that, that structure and that community existed even, even 15, 20 years ago, um, it seems like it really provides sort of scaffolding for you to, to kind of get there. Um, there are a lot of young people, a lot of people just starting out who, who kind of get their start doing that writing fan fiction or. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And regardless of what your project is, you can find a community, whether it's Nano or somewhere else online or 
whenever we're able to in person. Um, and have just some sort of feeling that you aren't alone in this process because a lot of times at the core of it all, it is you and the computer and it's mm. you and the page and having someone else encouraging word from time to time can be extraordinarily helpful. Um, speaking of community, how, how has the pandemic or has it changed your writing process? Have, have you, was your community already mostly online or have you kind of um, had to find some other, other way to interact with other writers? How, how, what, has, what has the pandemic done to you, Eden? <laughs> Honestly, as far as writing goes, not much. Hmm. Um, I tend to have most of my community online. Mm -hmm. Most of my community for writing is in the States, so a lot of it is coordinating times to meet and talk virtually, share work virtually. So um, I don't tend to go and write in a cafe like some people do or, or any of that. I'm very much a, this is my office, this is where I work, and pandemic-wise, my, my big issue is I can't go out for a fancy dinner and celebrate after I finish a project. <laughs> hopefully soon. Hopefully, hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Um, do you have any other advice, publishing, writing for, for folks getting started? I will say, especially for Southerners, mm -hmm. um, especially for people that are writing in languages that are not English, mm -hmm. I will say when you write, make sure you tell the story as truly as you possibly can. If you're self-publishing, then you don't have anything to worry about. You're completely in control of the process from writing to editing to formatting to cover design. Um, all of that is up to you. But when you're going for traditional publishing, you may have to realize at some point, you may have to have a discussion with some of the people that are helping you bring that book to fruition. This is the language that I like to use. This is the dialect that I like to have included. Um, it's important for this word to be in this language and realize that you may have to actually explain how important that is to the story for you and how that is important to the character development or to the plot, because that was a lot of what I had to do with Root Magic, explaining that it was important for certain words to be in Gala. It was important that the cadence of some of these characters' speech showed that these people were Geechee people. And a lot of times in traditional publishing, at least, the people that you're working with aren't familiar with the part of the country that you're from, and they aren't familiar with the language. So there is going to be a little bit of um, bringing people up to speed with what you're writing that you'll have to have to know going in that will probably occur. That's probably a good tip. Um, you <laughs> said in your in your author's note or online, you one of the things that you do in your spare time is perfect your master chef's signature dish. I was wondering if you would tell us what that is. Well, it changes occasionally. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think I go on there and I'm just gonna make she crab soup. Mm -hmm. um, and then other times I think I'm going to make this incredible dessert concoction that's you know something like what i call triple b ice cream which is brown sugar buttermilk and bourbon ice cream and maybe do it with uh an ice cream sandwich wedged between two benny seed cookies oh that's so decadent sounding <laughs> <and> delicious sounding <laughs> um do you cook a lot in your spare time or just a hobby or um i taste do. of home <laughs> I do cook a lot. It is very much a, a taste of home for me. My mother sends me uh, Sea Island red peas so that I can make my hop and John. I have okra seeds, so I grow my own okra, my own mustard greens, um, different varieties of tomatoes. So that's really part of my heritage that I still wanted to keep true today, mm -hmm. regardless of where in the world I live. So making those dishes is it is a little bit of a taste of home and sometimes I'm in desperate need of that. Yeah. 
I'll bet. I know so much of, of being Southern is kind of tied up with the cuisine and the, the different regional dishes and um, it's nice. That's, I like that your mom sends you red peas. That's really she does. She sends me care packages. And I think she's in the, she's in our virtual audience. Is that right? She is somewhere in the virtual <laughs> audience out there. Hi, mom. Hello, mom. Um, We've got uh, about 15 or 20 minutes left. I thought, Dutch, we might see if there's any um, questions from the audience now. Yes, yeah, yeah, we You're probably we have tired a... of hearing me talk. <laughs> we have a decent amount that came in. Oh, great. Um, so yeah, let's, I can, I'll be the voice of the audience tonight or this afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. Well, tonight for you, Eden, <laughs> but tonight uh, for me. this afternoon for us. Um, so Silas would love, love to know, uh, do you plan on writing a sequel? You, you mentioned your, your upcoming works, but is it this, this story something that you would revisit? I would love to revisit it. Um, I have ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't actually put pen to paper yet. Yeah. or started typing yet <laughs> but i would i would love to do a sequel to it at some point Good. knowing that other people have responded well to root magic that definitely helps me you know move those ideas up my list and that people want a sequel so i'm making a note to myself you know <laughs> silas wants a sequel to root magic <laughs> make it happen <laughs> make it happen <laughs> um, so we do have one question um, about your who you were influenced by um, so that, for example rl stein with horror and, and being a kid but is there something that you remember being influenced by that really guided you into the writing and the styles that you you write today one of the big things was stories that my grandmother told me mm -hmm. um as i mentioned earlier um she loved dark fiction and horror movies and all that other sort of stuff. So she always had some sort of story about a local monster or creature, or she had these uh, warning stories that she would tell me. They were probably intended to keep me out of trouble, but I was, <laughs> I was so fascinated by them that that was a big part of, you know, what I remember, especially with um, Root Magic and a couple of my other short stories. Uh, one of which specifically is in Spook Lights called The Choking Kind, that is directly based off of one of my grandmother's stories that sort of sent this little chill down my spine when she told me. Um, but I, I read voraciously as a child. You name it, I read it. My mother took me to the library every week, and I would come out with these stacks of books, probably when I was holding them would most cover my vision. So... <laughs> You name it, I absolutely read it, including some of the books that she happened to have in the attic that um, she had from her high school and, and college courses. Is there any of those books that particularly stand out to you from your childhood? Um, the Picture of Dorian Gray yeah. uh, was one of the ones that I absolutely loved reading. Um, just that the creepiness of not only the portrait or the picture, but the house and just people who are appearing normal, but have secrets and, and their own demons. Hidden, yeah. Yes, hidden yeah. demons um, that eventually sort of end up wreaking havoc. So that's to this day still something that, you know, I have a copy on my shelf somewhere. I was going to ask if it's something that you revisit and you so from childhood to now, it's still something that you, you can reread and get different perspective and inspiration from. Um, so that's good to hear that. I'm glad you still have a copy. <laughs> um, we have a few teachers in the audience um, and they mentioned they have Gullah Geechee students and they're thrilled that um, they're being represented in a book. Um, and they'd like to know if you'd still continue to write stories that include that cult cultural representation. Um, oh, absolutely. Um, the one that I mentioned earlier, which is the contemporary middle grade, mm -hmm. that will have um, Gullah Geechee culture. It will have um, a lot more characters that are Gullah Geechee people, mm -hmm. um, kids especially. And this one will be as far as I know from what I've turned in, who knows what happens after edits and <laughs> all of that sort of thing. But it'll be um, more kids involved, um, more sort of a an understanding of hoodoo culture and, and root work culture, just sort of broadening it out from the small family aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So there'll definitely be more of that. Yeah. 
we, we there's more there's more gratitude and thanks coming in about the incorporation of the hoodoo and everything like that um so it, it people are really they truly are are grateful that we have authors like you who who do want to tell your perspective but it, it's also it also relates um and i think what's incredible is that for the people that it's it doesn't directly relate to they get to experience it like you said in that authentic and true to yourself narrative um so one other question we have is um can you talk about the incorporation of black poetry um in the book yes um that was one of the things that um i learned from my mom she had poetry books um a lot of those things were books that i just saw on the shelf that i wanted to pull out and read she had langston hughes she had gwendolyn brooks she had Audre Lorde, she had all of these books that I just loved because they were these short passages that had an economy of words. Mm -hmm. And I really, really loved that. And I think that was probably part of the reason I started writing short stories mm -hmm. because I just loved how you could compact so much emotion and imagery into such a short space. I wouldn't by any means say that I think that I could write poetry but I think that a lot of times Black poets are, and poets in general, they're sort of a, a voice of the people of their time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times those poets are not always focused on in children's literature. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times it's more sometimes short stories or novels, but poets you may not get until you're in high school. Yeah. sometimes you know older than that or if you seek it out yourself so i wanted to incorporate that because i wanted kids to see that there were black poets that were writing these amazing words and especially have jez experience that there was this black woman writer that won the biggest award for poetry that there is who was at the time of the book still writing and there's that feeling that you think oh my gosh i could meet that person yeah. i could talk to them maybe one day that will happen and I just wanted to give that sort of sense of amazement and wonder of there are people that were at the time doing amazing big things. Because yeah. I think kids need to see that so that they can picture themselves doing amazing big things as well. Yeah, I, it's to me, it, it, it gives me goosebumps to think about like, um, it's as simple as just having someone to look up to or, or experience. Um, and it's it's important for kids to have that um, opportunity. Um, even I, Nadi, I, I wouldn't even say that it's just specifically for kids, but all of us. I think that's something that um, that I'm grateful that's becoming towards the forefront. Is that um, I know our, our bookseller downstairs. Um, they they they're having more and more people come in their store and ask. I want to read something that that is from a completely different narrative and perspective. I want to read a black author. I want to read a Jewish American author. I want to read something from the LGBTQ community. And so there's this commonality that's happening where people who love books love hearing those perspectives. Uh, so it, it, it's exciting to get to see and it's exciting to get to to hear and listen to it, it happen in real time. Um, one question that we do have um, is that with your writing process, do you prefer prompts or do you just organically um, work through your writing? I don't typically use writing prompts um, because I almost always have a notebook with me and I can get an idea from anything. Mm -hmm. If I listen to a song lyric, um, I love quiz shows. So sometimes I'll watch a quiz show and there'll be a question and it just makes me think of the idea and I'll end up going down this rabbit hole of researching that particular topic yeah. just because I saw it in a quiz show. Yeah. So I don't typically use prompts, but I think they can be extremely helpful, um, especially when you're a new writer. And a lot of times it isn't that you don't have ideas. It's that you don't always trust your ideas yet. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes, especially new writers, have a tendency to self-reject their ideas. They think, oh, I could do this. Oh, well, that won't be good enough. Or that's been done already. And a lot of times it's good to remember that it may have been done by someone, but it hasn't been done by you. 
Yeah. And that's why it's always important to bring part of yourself to your writing, because there are lots of ideas that have been explored, but they haven't been explored by you. That's, it's a, that's such a simple yet effective way to look at it. And I think a, a lot of young writers should probably hear that. And a lot of students should hear that, that it doesn't, you're not trying to compare yourself or your writing to anyone who's come before you. It's about what you're putting your pen to your paper and the story you want to tell. Um, so exactly. I, like, I like that a lot. <laughs> um, so one thing I, I heard just talk about, and um, Darcy mentioned it a little, but so you have, uh, you said your writers, your writer friends on Zoom. So do you guys just get together in a Zoom room and chit chat and say like, oh, this is what I'm working on. Does this sound right? And read to each other. Do you, is there workshopping that that happens uh, just kind of organically with your buddies on Zoom? That, we don't uh, workshop. <laughs> We don't workshop, but we have a tendency to sometimes let life get in the way and the day will end without having written. So we actually get on Zoom to write. Huh. So we get on there, everybody shows up by whatever the time is that's the deadline. If you want to say what you're working on, you can. Yeah. It isn't a requirement, um, but the person that leads the Zoom says, uh, okay, well, we're gonna work until this time and you mute yourself and you start working so that when you look up, it's not just your blank screen. You can see that there are other people there um, torturing themselves about are their ideas you know, workable or not. So it's again, that sort of way of not feeling alone in your endeavor. So we're not talking to each other. We're sitting there writing and, and working out our plot lines and working out our ideas. That's really awesome. I, I... I never would have thought of that I, or I would never would have expected that but that's that's a really cool way that I mean even in these odd times we we get to experience each other and and share our art even if it's that means we're just sitting in silence with each other working um so I do want to remind everyone that we do have I'm putting it in the chat now we uh, a link to purchase a copy of Eden's book um they are signed we got book plates all the way from the UK down here to Charleston <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're, really, we're really excited to have them. Um, so if you are interested, you can contact Bucks and Books or use that link um, that we just put in the chat. Um, and before we go, Eden, my, I always like ending on this question or somewhere ending around this question, but do you have any recommendations? What are you reading right now? What are you watching? Um, what should people put themselves out there and, and go pick up at a bookstore um, besides your book, obviously, um, or, or watch on TV? Oh gosh, there's so many. We should have started with this question. Yeah. There's so many. <laughs> it's a snowball. <laughs> suggestions out there. Um, I would say um, one of the things that I read, it isn't middle grade or YA, mm -hmm. but um, it is a collection of short stories that is about Black Southern womanness, which is um, by Disha Filia, and it's The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, which is an incredible book. It is absolutely wonderful. I've been recommending it to pretty much everyone that asks me. <laughs> um, I will say um, another book, it isn't available yet, but it is up for pre-order. Um, it's called Bacchanal. Um, it's by Veronica Henry. And it is about um, a creepy, eerie carnival. And the Black woman who is running from her background and runs away to this carnival um, and tries to exist and tries to focus her powers of being able to control animals in order to bring some control to her own life. And you get lots of creepy mystery and of course, all of the uh, other carnival uh, inhabitants. So it's, if you like spookiness, if you like mysteries, definitely pre-order that one. Sounds really good. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, as far as um, anything else, gosh, I'm looking at my bookshelf here. <laughs> I have uh, Legend Foreign by Tracy Dion, mm -hmm. which is another Southern, uh, another Southern book, um, North Carolina this time. Mm -hmm. But there's also incorporations of root magic um, in that book as well. I also have... Um, one of my things that I always recommend to people, it's not new, um, but anything by J. California Cooper, I think that 
She is one of the people that I always go back and reread, um, especially pandemic wise. I feel like her work is sort of like coming home for me. Yeah. So any of her short stories are absolutely wonderful. And gosh, TV, a lot of my TV watching um, right now is uh, limited to reruns. <laughs> a lot of times I'm, because I'm writing and I'm working, I can't, um, I can't get too emotionally invested in the show right now. I can't do that. But lots of re, uh, reruns of um, Criminal Minds and MasterChef and Hell's Kitchen and all those things like that. Wonderful. Are pretty much where I, um, where I spend most of my TV watching nowadays. At some point, I'll get back to um, a lot of the other shows. But the last show that I think I watched start to finish um, and enjoyed was Lovecraft Country. On HBO. Yes. Yeah, yeah that, that's on my list. So I'll, I'm definitely going to watch it. And you'll be happy to know I just saw something that I believe may be Paramount Plus um, is looking into um, re um, bringing back Criminal Minds. Um, so yes, I if, had heard that. If you're a Criminal Minds fan, then uh, get excited. Some, and fingers. <laughs> something else to add to my ever growing to watch list. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, I just want to thank you again um, for sharing your perspective and reacting to the world around you and 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 giving us that perspective and that that narrative. Um, we've I've personally absolutely loved this. Um, I'm really excited. You got a, a book already written so that means we're going to bring you back for that um <laughs> whether it's in that would be my pleasure uk no matter what we're definitely going to bring it back um because this has been great and so i just want to thank you i want to thank all of our friends at the public library uh devin darcy angela um you guys were wonderful and we're, we're so happy to be able to celebrate an author like yourself uh Eden. so i want to give you the one one person round of applause <laughs> in the I'll zoom help, room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh and just again, thank you so much. Um, if you have any any questions for Eden, uh, feel free to reach out to us here at the library or anyone at the public library. If you buy yourself a copy from a local bookseller um, and just really enjoy it. And uh, I just wanna say thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it greatly. Yeah. We'll Thanks. see you soon. Bye, thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Bye everybody.